Great, then I would say let's start. Welcome everyone to the sixth lecture on requirements engineering today covering the topic of non-functional requirements. And with this topic, uh, we will be closing already the chapter on more engineering centric topics on the elicitation, refinement and specification of requirements of different classes before then concluding with more management centric topics covering at least briefly um, quality assurance in requirements engineering and our favorite topic requirements management. Now, um, as it should be always the case for a good lecture, let's start by recapitulating what you learned uh, in the last lecture. In the last lecture, we covered the topic of functional requirements as a means to describe user visible external black box behavior of a software system. And we discussed more generally um, the notion of functional behavior at different levels of abstraction, some of which did not consider a software system at all, but described more the operational background and the workflows that have to be carried out from which we can draw uh, insights on how future end users intend to interact with the software system. So one of the things we left open is how to capture non-functional properties of a software system effectively. So you notice here maybe that I wrote effectively and not efficiently because non-functional requirements is something uh, that is quite challenging. Now, uh, <laughs> as it should be the case for all good requirements engineering lectures, also here a small uh, disclaimer. You may recall um, from the last lecture on functional requirements that we said that the literature is quite full when it comes to the specification of functional requirements, what functional requirements um, are. And that gave us um, the opportunity to be able to concentrate on the essence as reflected by the concept model of MDIA. Now, the good news uh, when it comes to non-functional requirements is that also here, the literature is, is rather full. We have many, many different approaches covering the particularities of different requirements classes, like, like security or safety and uh, at the same time, and this is the bad news, um, there's still no, no common, uh, more unified uh, approach to efficiently handle non-functional requirements covering all these different manifestations and interpretations, such as security or safety. Now, the situation, however, is so bad that we don't even have a common agreement on what non-functional requirements really are, or more precisely, how to classify them. At the same time, and this is an agreement, um, non-functional requirements are those requirements that tend to make a difference. They are very, very critical for project success. Which means that in contrast uh, to when it comes to functional requirements, uh, the topic of non-functional requirements needs, um, I would say, far more attention that, uh, than any single lecture could ever give, maybe even an entire course. So my hope for today is that I can at least increase your sensibility for the relevance and the challenges um, you might experience when being exposed to non-functional requirements. Um, also, uh, what the literature has to say and um, that it's not really sufficient to come up to, uh, to tackle the challenges that we face in practice. And last but not least, how we do it in MDIA and why we do it the way uh, we do it in MDIA. Now, all that being said, uh, even if you have a reference model like MDIA that guides you through the classification and specification uh, of non-functional requirements, this can never compensate for missing experience and expertise um, for the different classes of non-functional requirements, such as security, such as performance or usability, which is also the reason why it's so important to apply it also yourself and to play around with the different classes as we will learn it. Uh, today, which is, as always, in scope of the hands-on section. So what are the goals um, of today? As I mentioned already, the goals are to increase the awareness for the importance and the challenges when dealing with non-function requirements. Number two, to get a brief overview, at least, of the existing literature, um, including particularly classification models for non-function requirements and why they are not sufficient to cope with the challenges we encounter in practice before then learning how to specify non-functional requirements along the MDIA model, covering again, surprise, surprise, different levels of abstraction, as well as 
different content items. Now, three topics for today, relevance and challenges uh, in non-functional requirements, existing classification models for non-functional requirements, and how to incorporate them in MDIA. So let's start with the challenges and let me here directly start with a small terminological challenge. As you may recall from our introductory lectures, we have back then classified um, or introduced a coarse-grained categorization of requirements. And back then we introduced functional requirements, which by now we understand very well, and non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements, we said, is everything that is not functional. And this, of course, is rather um, unsatisfying, which is the reason why we back then already introduced two more uh, fine-grained classes. So we will be refining the terminology in the different classes later. But for now, we can dis distinguish already uh, quality requirements or quality attributes that my software product sh shall have. So product-oriented um, quality. This includes typically quality characteristics and properties of a software system. This is where you find all these elites like usability, modifiability, maintainability, but also security, safety, performance, all these more non-functional qualitative um, attributes. And other than those more product specific uh, quality requirements, we can distinguish more process oriented quality attributes. So these are typically restrictions or constraints imposed on the development process including things like scheduling, milestones, budgets, but also the software process model used, and restrictions imposed more on the actual implementation, on the solution space. For example, um, that certain uh, programming paradigms maybe should not be used, like object orientation, or that a specific language must be used, or that an Oracle database has to be used. Now, one thing to be aware of is that in literature, very often, quality requirements and non-functional requirements are treated as they would be the same. They are very uh, often used as synonyms and interchangeable. Now, this is important to understand. Quality requirements and non-functional requirements are not the same. So we have different requirements classes that all of them have different concerns and therefore require a different way of handling them, ranging from the elicitation over the refinement, classification, and the verification. A simple example, uh, let's take um, a constraint on the implementation where you could have, uh, for example, something like uh, this programming language has to be used, for example, Java, um, and compare this with more usability oriented needs by the end user. So we approach both classes very, very differently, which is what we mean by concern. Now, let's talk more generally first about quality and why even bothering. So as I mentioned earlier, the project success is often, if not always, measured in terms of quality. And here we can distinguish two perspectives. One is on the product quality, where we have the quality attributes, such as usability, performance, security, safety, and reliability, availability. I could go on and on. I will show you later uh, a taxonomy. And next to that, we can have a perspective on the process quality. So this includes typically time and cost, for example, cost of production, operation, maintenance, evolution, and so on. Now, as if that would not be already quite complicated, in addition to that, we need to consider both also in relation to the relevance to the stakeholders in terms of cost and benefit. Uh, let's take one simple example. Think again of the A. ATM and imagine you would be in a workshop and one of the stakeholders would say, my ATM needs to be available 100%, so 24-7. From the perspective of the stakeholder, this might very well make sense, of course, but as an engineer, you might think, mm, this could be quite expensive. Is it really worth it? Think about it. Is it really worth the cost? Would you be able to measure the cost? Is it even feasible 100%? Now, I did my homework. I checked um, a couple of service providers, among them uh, Amazon Computing. And not even the Amazon Computing service level agreement promises 100%. <laughs> and I would assume that they could at least afford a proper infrastructure from all the money they save from not paying their employees. <laughs> But so 
100% might be a little bit too much. It's difficult to assess if the stakeholder really needs 100%, 24-7, even at night. Does 3% less make a difference, 97%? A difference in, in terms of relevance, but also in terms of cost of implementing that. Now, I hope you see where I'm going with this. Um, measuring whether my software system fulfills uh, the availability of 97%, for example, or 98%. This is not the problem. Specifying the requirement in a measurable way is not really the challenge. But this is also not the point. How to measure what is really necessary and how to measure what is really justified, this is the challenge. And this is the problem we have with quality requirements. At the same time, these tiny differences tend to make the difference. This is what can turn a good enough product into a really good product or a good enough product into a really bad product. Now, let's consider the example of smartphones at the bottom, which you can see. Now, two randomly chosen smartphones. You see one iOS-based uh, device and one Android-based device. I would say that from a purely functional perspective, when it comes to the basic functionality, they are the same. I can log in in both, I can uh, make phone calls in both, I can send messages, I can go online, I can track my location with GPS. From a perspective of functional requirements, they tend to be the same. When it comes to quality, they are both very, very different, very different. And I invite you to challenge me on that. Now, what do you think? <laughs> Which of those phones has a higher quality? The same. <laughs> now you sound like my mother. <laughs> exactly. This is exactly the point. It depends very much on what you value. I could take different perspectives, for example, on, I don't know, on security. No, my security, security is, I think, a bad example for those. I could take a perspective on, let's say, usability. And I could say, uh, maybe I, as a, as a middle-aged, clumsy professor, uh, might prefer one over the other. I think it's more usable, but it could be also what I'm used to being using. Um, I could think of openness, for example. One uses an open source uh, uh, based operating system. The other one, more or less the opposite of this in terms of customization, but in the very end, it very much depends on what I, as a consumer, value. And this is, this is essentially the difficulty of quality requirements. Uh, in the very end, it's something very subjective and it very much depends on the eye of the beholder. Or as Justice Stewart, Supreme Court Justice Stewart, has put it so eloquently, I know it when I see it, which very well <laughs> describes the problem we have with quality requirements. Of course, he was not talking about smartphones, uh, he was talking about, I, I leave this open to you to find out what he was talking about. It's a little Easter egg, maybe. But uh, take with you the following. Specifying quality requirements is very, very difficult. It's very, very problematic. This starts with the elicitation of quality requirements in terms of what is really needed over the analysis of quality requirements in terms of what is really feasible. Uh, over the specification of quality requirements in terms of how to make them measurable, testable, uh, over to the assessment of quality requirements in terms of verifying their correctness, but also their relevance to the stakeholders. Now, not specifying uh, quality requirements, neglecting them is, of course, even worse. Now, at this point, I could uh, tell you further some some. Um, smart insights, but I think at this point it's uh, maybe better to just fool around a little bit with a couple of examples. And all of those examples, and this is important to understand, all of those in examples uh, we could see already in practice. They have made it to requirements, specifications, most of which have been accepted. And please keep always in mind, the people that specified those requirements are highly skilled engineers. They know very well that some of those requirements are not really good, but they could not really deal with them because it's very, very 
complicated. Now, let's start with the very first example. And I think that you have seen it already in one of the past lectures. Now, this requirement has been classified as a performance requirement. So the performance of a software system. And it says the perceived response time shall not be too high. So what problems do we face um, when formulating a requirement like this? It's uh, very difficult to uh, verify that uh, exactly. requirement. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's not ver verifiable. Always ask yourself, can I test it? This is a very important question. Always keep this question in mind. Can I test it? Can I test my system against this requirement? Can I unambiguously, objectively decide if my software system satisfies this requirement or not? Now let's keep playing with this very example. Um, at which level of abstraction would you say is this requirement? Is this more at the context level, uh, which is more bound to general motivations and operational background, or is it uh, at the level of a proper requirement? Exactly, perfect. So right now it's at the level of um, the context layer. We would classify it as a, as a goal bound to motivation in this class, uh, in this case as a, as a um, system goal. Um, but as such, it leaves open a huge variation of different possible interpretations. Now, uh, how do we turn it into something measurable? Uh, think of goal refinement um, by asking how questions what question? So typically as a requirements engineer, I would try to refine it to a more measurable level. And this I can do by asking what exactly do you mean by uh, the perceived response time uh, is not too high. So at this level, I could add, uh, for example, metrics and measurements. I could play around with different forms of implementation, what they said, progress bar, as you said. Um, in terms of metrics and measurements, uh, I could, for example, say that the response time shall not be higher than 20 milliseconds. And I can go even further. I can to take it even so far um, as to specify, for example, um, expected workloads. So how many users do I expect to access uh, the software system in parallel? Is it one? Is it 50,000? Makes a big difference. So anything that I need to be able to test it. Now, there's another little problem with this, or challenge, I should say, with this performance requirement. Can you spot it? If I write down my requirement like this, the response time shall not be high or not too, uh, too high, or even if I write the response time should not be higher than 20 milliseconds, it's still not clear what is concerned with this requirement. So what is exactly affected? Right now at this level, the requirement has a cross-cutting concern. All I can say is that the requirement holds for the entire system, but this is of course not, I think, the intention of the stakeholder. So typically I would bound, bind the, um, function, uh, the uh, performance related requirements to a specific function, Just for example, to a specific use case. So my search function um, should not take longer than 20 milliseconds, but probably this has, does not have to hold for the entirety of the whole functionality. Now, once we can measure um, um, the, the, the actual performance requirement, and once we know what parts of the software system are affected uh, at this point, we can test it. So always remember, can I test it? This is always the guiding question when talking, especially about non-function requirements. Now, let's take another example. The system shall be secure. So again, at which level of abstraction would this be? In the very essence, it's the same as the one we had before. It's again uh, expressing more a prescriptive statement of intent, uh, a quality need for us. It would be uh, at the level of a system goal. How do I refine it? Again, the same way um, in terms of goal refinement by asking what questions and how questions. What do you mean um, by the system shall be secure? And uh, you might recall when we played around with this very example already that this refinement could turn my requirement into, uh, for example, the description of 
um, how an end user needs to authenticate with the system, which I can express with a scenario and by definition, it would then be a functional requirement. So what we did here is to change the classification from a non-functional high level goal to a functional requirement. Is this a problem? <laughs> I would say no. This doesn't really matter. What matters is I can test it. I can properly decide how to realize this system, uh, this requirement, and whether my software system, my final product, eventually satisfies this requirement or not. Now let's take a mean example. <laughs> the system shall be maintainable. Again, it's at the level of a goal. We express a desired quality attribute. So it's a system goal. How can I refine it? This is difficult. So um, maintainability or maintainable is what we call typically an internal quality attribute in contrast to these quality in use or more external, externally visible like performance, reliability, availability. These things that I can perceive as an end user, maintainability addresses a different perspective. But again, also here, we will learn later how we can deal with those, um, uh, those high level non-functional requirements. Now, at this point, I would like to stop with the examples, but briefly recapitulate some major challenges uh, as we encounter them in practice. So what are the challenges in practice? In a nutshell, quality requirements are very, very, very difficult to handle. So this starts from a structured elicitation and refinement of uh, quality requirements. Sometimes it's rather uh, easy or seems to be rather obvious. Think of performance requirements that I can refine uh, in a rather straightforward manner by attaching metrics and measurements and asking what they really expect. Um, sometimes it's not really easy. Think in terms of maintainability. Uh, the testability suffers as a consequence of the lack of refinement or the lack of possibilities of refining non-functional requirements. The cross-cutting nature, some uh, non-functional requirements are bound to specific functions or functionality such as performance. Others are more cross-cutting. They concern the entirety of the system or its internal realization and structure. And of course, the systematic assessment in terms of relevance and cost. Now, at this point, let's have a look at what the literature has to say when it comes to non-functional requirements. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, when it comes to the literature about uh, how to classify non-functional non requirements or what they really are eventually, um, as I mentioned, there, is, there exist many seminal papers, so important papers, um, many seminal books, standards and quasi-standards, all of which uh, touch on the notion of non-functional requirements, uh, but unfortunately none of which give us a proper definition of what non-functional requirements are. Now what you can see here is a table uh, that summarizes a little bit the body of knowledge with respect to the definitions of non-functional requirements. This table is not done by me, but uh, by a colleague, Martin Glintz, from the University of Zurich, uh, coming from the paper on non-functional requirements, which is a very interesting read, if I may add. Now, if there's one agreement, it's uh, that there is no commonly accepted definition. So, for example, even the standards like the IEEE standard, um, all they have to say essentially is that the term is not really defined. And even more, most of the definitions provided define non-functional requirements by giving examples, by referring to specific quality attributes. So for example, uh, Robertson and Robertson, two persons by the way, uh, define non-functional requirement as a property or quality that the product must have, such as appearance or speed or accuracy property. No, this is by example. Maybe another example is <laughs> Cotonia, writing that uh, requirements which are not specifically concerned with the functionality. So basically a non-functional requirement is, is not functional. This is not, not very helpful. Or let's take the last one, this is fun. Milopoulos, a global requirement on its development or operational cost performance, reliability, maintainability, portability, <laughs> robustness, and the like. Here's the point. My 
intention is not to make fun of them. It's just a very, very difficult topic. It's very difficult to capture the essence of what non-function requirements really are and what they are not. And very often they are just associated with what we call quality attributes or quality characteristics. And these quality attributes and these quality attributes uh, are what are in scope of so-called quality models or system quality models. So let's have a brief look at what these quality models have to say. This is just a quick excursion um, coming not from requirements engineering, but from a different perspective. In this case, quality management or quality engineering. Now, what are quality models? Quality models or quality definition models also often called are models that define which quality aspects and concepts exist and how they are related to each other. They essentially say what quality is and how I can categorize the different, the different perspectives on quality. So quality models are typically captured in form of a taxonomy. So the taxonomy you can see here is the one that has been established by the International Standardization Organization, ISO, uh, as part of the standard for quality. And these quality taxonomies distinguish external quality and internal quality. Typically, external quality refers to the quality in use. So all these things that I can uh, perceive as an end user, internal quality uh, attributes refer more to the internal realization of a software product in terms of structure and how these uh, single elements relate to each other and what properties they have. And you can see here already the reason why they are often referred to as the elites. So for example, usability is one such quality attribute. And this is then further refined to understandability, learnability, operability, and so on and so forth. Now, these quality models are very helpful because they give us a big picture about what uh, different quality attributes to consider in principle. But they all share one uh, set of problems. They stay often, well, all of them actually stay at the level of the so-called elites. And they don't go in, uh, much further to the level of something that I could really measure. So they don't give us any guidance on how to measure these elites. And they cannot. They are standards. They structure the, the terminology. They structure the domain. But they don't tell you how to do things. So this is one of the problems. They stay at this level of the abstract elites uh, and don't propose specific measurements. Another problem is uh, in terms of completeness. If you stay just vague enough, it's very difficult to say to which extent these standards are complete or not. I cannot tell and most of the others probably also cannot tell. And lastly, of course, uh, these models come from a different disciplines. Uh, discipline requirements engineering is not in scope of them. Anyway, let's uh, keep this small discussion because there's one specific quality model I would like to briefly share with you. Now, in response um, to this lack of, of measurability, in response to the, um, this more abstract and vague notion uh, that you can find in these quality models, there have been some trends in the research community. One of these trends has led to um, approaches to support quality modeling and quality assessment. And what they did is they took a different perspective on these LETs driven more by the desire to have something that they can measure. Most of these approaches come from the area of software maintenance uh, rather than requirements engineering, needless to say. And one such example I would like to show you is the activity-based quality model. Now, what is so special about models like them? So what these models do, so first of all, these emerge from academia industry collaborations and driven by the need to tackle the practical problems out there, among them, the lack of measurability. And what these models do, they take a different perspective. They define quality by the extent to which um, software or system properties, the structure and the elementary properties of a system support or hinder the activities I want to carry out. So for example, instead of saying I need to um, support the maintainability ability by the understandability and so on, they ask what are the typical tasks associated with software maintenance. For example, understanding the code. Code comprehension is one such thing. And code comprehension includes reading techniques, specific reading techniques and how to understand software code. 
And based on this understanding on the activities, I can start thinking and reflecting about what the properties are that a software system must have in order to have a positive influence on my reading. So for example, I need unique identifiers. I need to have a specific code structure and format. I need to have, for example, a specific documentation of my code, uh, a comment density of my code. And this is how we can then measure the uh, software uh, quality. By asking ourselves to which extent does my software system support the activities. Now, there is a reason I'm mentioning this very specific um, quality model, which is that we will be using uh, the very same idea also in context of MDI, at least as a fallback solution. Whenever I have um, a quality goal, a system goal that is very hard to measure, such as maintainability, instead of trying to invent certain measurements and metrics, um, I can ask instead, okay, what are the typical interactions? What are the typical tasks that need to be carried out during maintenance? And this allows me to infer something that I can at least decide, something that I can test. Now, but this only as a small excursion, uh, but let's summarize uh, these quality models still by, by keeping in mind that requirements engineering has never been in scope of these models. So let's have a quick look at what the requirements engineering models and taxonomies have to say. So the requirements engineering taxonomies uh, for non-functional requirements, they come from a different perspective and they structure uh, what um, different categories of non-functional requirements to consider. One such example is the non-functional requirements taxonomy introduced by Axel van Lamps Werdem uh, in a seminal book on requirements engineering, which you have also listed in uh, Canvas. Now, at this very example, we distinguish four different categories of non-functional requirements, starting from the quality of service. Uh, so everything that I as an end user can perceive, these user perceptible quality attributes or things like compliance or architectural constraints or development constraints. So for example, when it comes to the actual quality of service or the quality that I perceive as an end user, I can distinguish safety, security, reliability, and so on and so forth. Now taxonomies like this one are very, very helpful because they can help me um, uh, in the form of structuring my non-functional requirements and a requirement specification. And I can use them as a sort of a checklist, as a reminder, did I consider safety? Did I think of reliability? Uh, when eliciting my requirements and so on. Uh, however, that being said, they don't really guide the uh, refinement of requirements to a measurable level, especially from the perspective of the different concerns that the requirements and the different requirements may have, all of them requiring a different way of handling the requirements. Uh, just three very simple examples that you can find all under the very same umbrella of quality of service being security, performance, and usability. Think of the examples I've shown you before. Security tends to be of cross-cutting nature. Sometimes it's not even non-functional. It depends on how I refine it. Performance tends to be bound to a specific functionality, it tends to be part of a use case. When I elicit uh, performance requirements, I tend to do this along the same workshops, along the same uh, elicitation uh, workshops where I specify the functional behavior. Usability is typically bound to more structural entities of a software system, for example, interfaces or workflows, how I navigate through these interfaces. Now, this lack of a concern-based um, perspective has led to one response, which is another taxonomy that has been introduced by Martin Linz. And in this taxonomy, he defines a quality requirement as a requirement that pertains to a quality concern that is not already covered by functional requirements. So in consequence, when you see the different classification of the uh, requirements into functional requirements, then these quality attributes and constraints, he distinguishes performance and because performance tends to be treated very differently than the other, uh, what he calls explicitly than the other elites. Now, this uh, has been a very valuable contribution because it fostered an, uh, a much overdue discussion in the community of researchers and practitioners. And it's already the first step towards a more concern-based classification. Uh, it's very helpful, but 
needless to say, the actual guidance on how to refine uh, non-functional requirements over different levels of abstraction and how to ensure the measurability uh, has never been in scope of these um, taxonomies. Which brings me already to the conclusion on the state of the art. Um, the state of the art is useful to get a better understanding about what quality may be and what non-functional requirements may be, but they are rather weak when it comes to the practical challenges introduced uh, before. We have quality definition models that are based on what we call system models. Uh, they help us understanding what quality is and what we, how we can measure quality, but they completely ne neglect requirements engineering. Coming from the requirements engineering perspective, we have taxonomies to classify non-functional requirements to offer some sort of classification, but they do not cope with the challenges in practice when it comes to the refinement of requirements, how to make them measurable. So there is again a gap between practice and theory. Uh, that being said, in MDI, we are drawing from some of the insights we gained through practice and through uh, the theory in requirements engineering, which I will be introducing next. Great, so then uh, let's talk now about how non-functional requirements are covered in the MDIA model. Now, um, when it comes to MDIA, there are, um, there are two things that you need to understand. So number one is that MDIA is based on a system model. And you will find an excerpt of that system model in the extended slide set that I gave you as an excursion for the specification of the system uh, layer, for the system specification. What we mean by uh, that is that if you consider the conceptual model of MDIA, so where we uh, specify all the modeling concepts that need to be considered in requirements engineering, we don't focus only on the inner world world of requirements engineering. So what a use case is and how it relates maybe to a quality requirement or things like that. But what we do is we take a holistic, um, a holistic view on what the elements are at the system layer and how these elements of the system layer connect to the upper layers, to the requirements layer. Which means that by definition, uh, the MDIA concept model and the content model is concern-based because all the different entities that I specify during the requirements, requirements engineering, they need to lead somewhere, in this case to the system model. Now, the second thing is that MDIA um, is built around the very same um, idea and the principle that is also captured in the activity-based quality model. Um, the usage model or the um, the specification of how end users intend to intend to interact with our software system builds one fundamental part in requirements engineering. And we will be making use of both. So in consequence, especially of this concern-based classification that you have in MDIA, we distinguish four different uh, non-functional requirements classes. We distinguish process and deployment requirements that both concern restrictions on the engineering, so the way of working in the case of process, um, and the deployment process captured as deployment requirements. We have system constraints that concern restrictions on the solution space um, beyond what is necessary from a functional and a quality perspective. And we have, uh, last but not least, system-specific quality requirements concerning the quality characteristics and properties of a software system. Now let's go through them quickly and let's start with the upper three uh, classes because they tend to be also the easy ones. Now constraints, process and deployment requirements. So they all concern restrictions and this is important to understand. They concern restrictions uh, on the solution space or processual aspects so, so, such as process requirements and deployment requirements that are directly imposed by the stakeholders or the operational context. So these requirements tend to be non-negotiable restrictions that are already well justified by the actual operational context. And they are not typically associated with goals. They are just there and we have to deal with them. So two characteristics of them that are related to each other is that they are typically at least uh, represented in a more de declarative way which means that we verify them by a simple review and they tend to be hard requirements. That means that they're either fulfilled 
or not. There's no way around that. There's no margin of interpretation or negotiations. So when you look at the examples, you see what I mean. So an example for a system requirement could be that all interfaces must have a Java doc compatible documentation. Another would be that uh, we must not use object oriented paradigm or specific constructs constructs in object orientation such as inheritance due to uh, safety concerns and safety restrictions uh, or maybe legal restrictions of that particular industry sector. So process requirements could be, for example, demanding a certain compliance to a software process model. Deployment requirements is self-explanatory concerning the actual de deployment. So these requirements tend to be there. There's no way around them. These are more um, um, restrictions, non-negotiable restrictions of the way of working or the actual solution space. They mu we must conform to them. Now let's talk about quality requirement. As I mentioned earlier, uh, MDIA is based on this very idea of this activity-based quality model, which means that for us, system quality is defined by the extent to which my system properties and characteristics allow for its intended usage in a specific context. And that context can go beyond um, beyond the perspectives that are exclusively represented by the end users. We can also uh, consider the maintenance context to give you one example. So which means in turn that we can follow mostly the same refinement principles as those we have learned for specifying functional requirements. Now let's consider uh, how we do that. So quality requirements and the refinement uh, includes again two levels of abstraction and again three different content items. So with the system goals or with the context layer, I express my prescriptive statements of intent. It's a declaration of intent. Um, this is typically uh, what I see as a rationale for the requirements that motivate the further refinement and scoping by asking my what questions and my how questions. So I express my goals to motivate the further refinement. And I can do this um, same as with behavior modeling with functional properties, I can do this also for my non-functional properties by using what we call generic scenarios that are also part of the usage model. Now, generic scenarios are something more um, not pre-structured and pre-packaged like you would expect from a use case model. They are just simple ways with no specific, no specific rules or restrictions on how to specify these different interaction scenarios. But what I can express here motivated by the goals are um, generic scenarios, for example, that should be supported. Uh, consider the example of maintenance. So what uh, someone uh, in software maintenance intends to do, for example, in terms of modification of a software system. And this allows me to specify the quality requirements in a at least testable way. Um, to give you one example of for the scenarios that should be prevented, I can take also a more negative perspective. This could be, for example, attack scenarios. When I'm not able to refine security measures uh, or security goals to a measurable way, I can at least express them um, in the form of capturing scenarios with security breaches that should be prevented at all cost. Now at the third level, you see here already, by the way, that refinement um, at some level does not really distinguish between functionality and quality. Think of the standard example I gave you on security, where we refine security, the system shall be secure to, um, to the expressions of um, um, interaction scenarios, for example, how a user should authenticate with the system. At this point, uh, we would consider it as a functional requirement. We expressed both of them, doesn't matter if it's functional or non-functional, we express both of them with interaction models in a usage model. Now, at the last step uh, this of this refinement, we consider then quality requirements as something measurable, quantifiable uh, at an atomic level that I associate with very specific metrics and measurements. Now, let's go through the three levels to considering small examples. So again, system goals are abstract declarations of intent that further that justify the further uh, refinement of the requirements and later on also 
their costs. So I tend to refine those goals by asking my what questions, my how questions. So for example, the system shall be secure. I can refine this by asking what they exactly mean by secure or how we could achieve this in terms of interaction scenarios. From here, I have two options essentially. Either I'm able to directly infer proper metrics and measurements, think of availability where I can say it should be available up to a certain percentage or it should not bypass a certain downtime by a certain percentage. Or if I'm not able, I can use my generic scenarios. Now, generic scenarios are always a fallback solution. They are not the primary goal. I can use them in case I'm not really able to specify quantifiable quality requirements. And these are typically for these, what we call the hard cases, for example, maintenance or um, security related um, activities that should be prevented. What you can see here is one example for an attack scenario, for describing an attack scenario um, and that should be prevented. And if I'm not really able to infer and to turn my, my high level goal, the system shall be secure into something really measurable, I can, for example, describe um, a attack scenario that should be prevented. And I can do this by drawing from other guidelines that describe these typical, that capture these typical attack scenarios. For example, I don't know, SQL injections or you name it. There are multiple different ways uh, of fostering a security breach. These negative scenarios, by the way, are also called misuse cases. Misuse cases uh, have been introduced by the U University of Bergen and um, uh, define a uh, somehow structured way at least to specify these more negative interaction scenarios that I want to prevent with my software system. But keep in mind, there is no predefined structure. When we say generic scenarios, we just try to specify some sort of interactions that should be supported or that should be prevented. Finally, quality requirements, as I mentioned already, uh, are the level of requirements that I associate with very specific metrics and measurements that I tend to see as something measurable that I can decide. They, of course, in consequence, fulfill coming from this top-down relationship, this, this refinement relationship that I have. They tend to fulfill my quality-related system goals and enable my quality-related scenarios. But important is to understand that I should not model this whole top-down way. I should use either one or the other as a fallback solution. Examples for a more binary metrics where I can say yes, no, are given um, at the bottom of the slide just to give you a little bit of a feeling. Now, at this point, I would like to stop already with MDIA because I really believe that you need just to play around yourself uh, with one exemplary uh, quality attribute, which is in scope of our hands-on sessions, either the lab session or the project Q&A session. But let me conclude by recapitulating again the challenges we have encountered in practice. Uh, so what about this structured uh, elicitation and refinement? Is that supported when considering this top-down view, this rather simplified view? Yes, we have three different uh, content items for the quality requirements covering different levels of abstraction, ranging from system goals over generic scenarios to um, the level of quantified quality requirements. Are they testable? Yes, well, yes and no. At least I have a way to refine them and to capture them in a way that I can test, even if it's only by relying on generic uh, scenarios. The cross-cutting nature, as I've mentioned already, is captured by definition uh, of the underlying uh, MDIA concept model. And when it comes to the systematic assessment and relevance of costs, when I had back then started developing MDIA, I always try to argue, yes, yes, this is possible by, by using that technique or this technique, but truth is, no, not really. So it's, it's not really, it's not in scope of any guideline. This is an unsolved issue and when it comes to the assessment of the relevance of a requirement to the cost of a requirement. This is where you need experience and expertise. Now, that being said, speaking of experience and expertise, MDIA guides the refinement and specification of requirements of functional and non-functional requirements to the level that allows us to test them. But it's never a way, it's never a compensation for missing experience and expertise. As I said at the very beginning, um, you will always need 
a certain experience, which is also the reason why it's so important to try it out um, yourself. And also that being said, specifying quality requirements, I think especially of the, uh, the generic scenarios, tends to be something very, very labor intensive. And sometimes, sometimes uh, it might be justified to leave the non-functional requirement at the level of maybe not the perceived response type should not be too high, but maybe sometimes at this more generic high level. Which brings me to starting with a conclusion. As I mentioned already, you need to apply it yourself. You need to try it out yourself. And my proposal would be consider your project um, that you have and think about what the quality attributes are that might be really critical for this project. Decide for one or maybe two and think about how you plan to describe them in a measurable way. Brainstorm and bring this to the hands-on sessions so that we can discuss them all together. And with this, I would like to conclude today's lecture. Thank you very much for your patience and it's time for questions and discussion. If not, I can, so take one thing with you. I'm very, Julian and me are both very much aware that some of the topics tend to be more overwhelming. We've put a lot of effort, uh, as you can imagine, into trying to focus really on the essence. And still, this is very overwhelming. And this is perfectly fine. So really take your time, give it some time, let that sink in, and make use then of the project Q&A sessions, where we will have then the opportunity to really discuss the essence um, of how to specify them. And then maybe also, even if it's not during those project Q&A sessions, to agree with you on a joint bilateral session where we can help you and discuss with you how to do these things in context of your project.